for uh, joining us uh, today in a new session of our webinar series, The Aftermath of COVID-19, The New Social Impact Ecosystem. We really appreciate your presence and participation. Also, let me thank uh, our very special guest speaker today, uh, Professor uh, Mauro Guillen. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be part of the webinar series and to fit us. Thank you so much for inviting me. Very busy schedule. Thank, thank you. you for inviting Before me. Before I pass the floor to Professor. Thank you, you're most welcome. Thank you so much to you. Before I pass the floor to Professor uh, Guillen, I will introduce him first uh, uh, and then pass the floor. Uh, Professor Mauro is the uh, Zanman Professor of International Management at the Wharton School uh, with secondary appointments as Professor of Sociology in the School of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Education in the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. His research deals with globalization, the future of consumer and financial markets, the diffusion of innovation, uh, innovations in the global economy. His research and teaching have earned him awards from the American Sociolo Sociological Association, the Social Science History Association, the Academy of Management, the Gustavus Meyer Center for um, the study of uh, bigotry and human rights, and the Aspen Institute. Uh, Professor Guillen is the author of a dozen books uh, published by university presses, including Cambridge, Chicago, Oxford, Penn, Princeton, and Yale, on topics dealing with the history of management, the dynamics of globalization, the, respon the, uh, the response to pandemics, and the history of modernist architecture. In this uh, session, Professor Guillen will lead a discussion around his latest book, 2030, how today's biggest trends will collude and shape the future of everything. It's published by St. Martin Press. Uh, the book became an instant Wall Street Journal bestsellers and a financial uh, Times book of the year. Before we start, I just want to highlight something that Professor Guillen will talk today about trends that we may uh, know about some um, or even most of them separately. But his approach actually fills a, a void gap um, and talking about the coming together of these trends and the implication of this um, in the, uh, the, in the interaction of these different trends on the global uh, transformation. So we're looking forward. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Carmen, for your wonderful in introduction. I'm really happy to uh, be joining all of you in Egypt. Uh, I have been to Egypt uh, three times, uh, so uh, it is always uh, great to be able to interact with you. Uh, please let me know. Uh, you can send me an email or you can call me on the phone in case uh, the, we get disconnected, because today here in Philadelphia, which is where I live, uh, we have a very big snowstorm, so I'm hoping, fingers crossed, uh, that uh, the uh, uh, the connection uh, remains uh, steady over the next uh, 60 minutes. So I'm going to present for about uh, 25 minutes or 30 minutes on this topic of uh, what is it that the future is going to bring us uh, in the next uh, 10 years or so. Uh, the title of the book, as you know, is 2030. And what I focus is on what's going to happen in the world, what's going to happen uh, with uh, our lives uh, in the next uh, uh, 10 years or so. So I'm going to begin uh, sharing the screen. And of course, uh, I'm happy to make uh, this PowerPoint presentation available to everyone uh, after the uh, presentation. Uh, so I'm hoping uh, uh, that you can see the, uh, the screen right now. Is that correct? Yes? Okay. Yes, we do. Okay, yes. so uh, let me just tell you, uh, what are those uh, trends that are going on in the world right now that I cover in the book, but that I would like to bring to your attention today because I think they're going to change consumer markets, they're going to change financial markets, they're going to change society, uh, they're also going to change the economy. Uh, so the first trend is more grandparents than grandchildren. So in Egypt, you're not there yet, uh, but if you go to Japan, if you go to China, if you go to Europe, uh, even here in the United States, uh, either already today or in the next uh, five to 10 years, we're going to be in a situation in which 
uh, we have more grandparents and grandchildren. And that, of course, is because uh, the number of babies has been declining. And therefore, every generation that is born these days in the world is a smaller numerically than the preceding generation. So I'm going to tell you more details about this in a moment. Uh, the second big change is the emergence of the middle class in Asia and in Africa. Uh, so this is really, really important because, uh, as you know, for the last hundred years or so, we've had the middle class in Europe, we've had the middle class in the United States, the middle class in Japan, of course, Singapore, Canada, Australia. But fundamentally, we've had the middle class in Europe and a middle class, large middle class in the United States. And that's about it. But now, uh, as you will see later with some um, information that I'm going to share with you, the middle class is becoming bigger in Asia than it is in Europe and the United States combined. And of course, the middle class is fundamental for understanding markets. And the middle class, remember, it's also really important in politics, right? Uh, because uh, they are the largest segment of the population. And of course, they prefer certain policies over others. Um, the other thing, uh, third thing that is going to happen really important is that for as a consequence of the previous point, for the last uh, 80 years or so, um, brands and companies have uh, primarily been paying attention to the Asian consumer. And this is also going to change. It's going to change because once again, those markets in Asia are the biggest ones uh, now. Uh, change number four, also really, really important. Women as wealth holders. So I'll show you data in a moment showing that by the year 2030, women will own more than half of the net worth in the world. And that will be, of course, for the first time in history. And that's going to change quite a few things because women, on average, uh, they behave as consumers and as investors in a different way than men on average. Um, also, um, some trends here regarding technology, which is uh, something that is changing very, very quickly in the world. Um, by the year 2030, we're going to have more robots than workers. Uh, and that's not just uh, going to happen in manufacturing. It's also going to happen in the service sector. And by the way, it could also happen at universities, meaning that professors may be replaced at some point uh, by uh, computers, at least uh, for certain purposes. And we're going to have uh, more broadly more computers or microprocessors, if you want to put it that way, than human brains. Uh, and this, of course, is due to the Internet of Things. Uh, I will tell you also a little bit more about that later. And then the last trend that I want to talk to you about is perhaps the most controversial is that uh, we may end up having a lot more currencies than countries in the world. Uh, and those currencies, of course, will be cryptocurrencies and they will be, I think, widely used. So I will give you uh, a, little, a few more details about that in a moment. Now, uh, it's really, really important uh, also to think about how the present pandemic is changing things, because quite frankly, um, many of you, I'm sure, are thinking that it's very difficult to make projections to the year 2030 when we are in the middle of such a big uh, devastating effect uh, event, such a, a pandemic. And uh, excuse me, let me tell you the following. Uh, this pandemic that we're going through is very different from previous pandemics in history. Previous pandemics in history essentially um, stopped or slowed down pre-existing trends. But by contrast, the current pandemic is accelerating trends. So if you go back, for example, to the plague of Justinian in Byzantium, right? So uh, parts of Egypt uh, were uh, uh, included in the uh, Byzantine Empire, if you remember, uh, 1400 years ago. The plague of Justinian uh, wasn't an accelerator of trends. What it did was prevent uh, the emperor uh, from unifying the eastern and the western parts of the Holy uh, Roman Empire. Uh, so in other words, uh, what we're seeing here is that uh, that pandemic um, made history stop. It uh, slowed down pre-existing trends. I think the Black Death uh, had a similar effect uh, 1,200 years ago. And uh, the same goes, I think, uh, for other big events or pandemics that we've had in the world ever since. But this pandemic is different. I'm going to try to persuade you in a moment that this pandemic uh, will accelerate population aging in the world that it will also accelerate the rise of East Asian emerging markets. So I'm going to show you information about that. And uh, I think it's also a pandemic that has already demonstrated that it is increasing inequality, inequality by income, inequality by uh, race, inequality by gender. And then the most obvious effect 
the most obvious acceleration that we've seen is in terms of the use of technology. Now we are using technology to shop, to work, to learn, and also to have uh, fun, to entertain ourselves so much more so than before the pandemic. Uh, so once again, this pandemic is a great accelerator. And I'm going to show you in the next few minutes ways in which the pandemic has accelerated certain things. So for the next uh, 20 minutes until we go into Q&A, my methodology in terms of trying to understand what the future will bring proceeds in two steps. So the first step is to follow the babies. Why follow the babies? Well, because the babies are the future consumers. They're the future citizens. They're the future um, workers. So if we follow them into the future, we see how many of them there are, then we can get a better sense as to what the future will look like. And then the second step in my methodology is to multiply those numbers of babies by how much money they have in their pockets. Uh, and I will do that beginning in about 10 minutes from now. So uh, let me first uh, show you this chart, uh, which uh, I think tells a very simple story. Let me first explain what's on the chart. On the chart, we begin in the year 1950. I think uh, you can see my computer mouse pointing on the screen, right? Let me know if uh, you cannot, Carmen. Can you see it, the mouse? Okay. So we go to the year 2020 with actual data. And then the rest are uh, projections into the future. Vertically, we're measuring the number of children per woman. So this is called, as you see at the top, total fertility. And as you can see, this number has been dropping. It's been dropping in the developed parts of the world, such as Europe or the United States. It's been dropping in the emerging markets, the less developed, like China, India, Turkey, Egypt, uh, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, and so on. And it's also dropping in the poorest countries in the world, what I call here the least developed parts of the world. Okay. Now, the main reason for this, remember, there are other factors, but the main reason is that now women have better access to education in many parts of the world. And when women stay in school, they finish high school. Many of them also go to college. They go to AUC, for example, or they uh, go to graduate school. Then they pursue a job or a career. So they postpone having their first baby. If they postpone having their first baby, they end up having fewer babies in life. It's as simple as that, right? So the single most important factor here is women's education, because then if women get more education and they work outside of the household, then they postpone having their first baby. Now, I want to bring to your attention though something really important here though, which is that if you take a look at the curve at the bottom for the developed uh, countries in the world, you will see that since the year 2000, I'm pointing at it now with my mouse, actually the number is increasing. It's a very slight increase, but it is increasing. And the projection is that beyond 2021, it will continue to increase also very slightly. Now, most of this change is about uh, some countries in Europe, such as France, and also the United States. And it's driven by immigration. Immigrant families tend to have more children. And as you know, over the last 20 or 30 years, there's been an increase in the number of immigrant families, both in Europe, Western Europe, and in the United States. And therefore, now we're starting to see the consequence, which is that there's a slight increase in the fertility, in the total fertility uh, rate. And that's because, once again, of immigrant families. <laughs> So that's one side of the story here. The other side of the story is life expectancy. So how long are people expected to live on average? We want to know how many babies are born, but we also want to know how long they're expected to live. And here we find very, very good uh, news for everyone, which is that life expectancy is growing, right? So every year, the babies born are expected to live longer than before. And uh, as you can see over here, uh, at the present time, in the rich countries, a baby born this year is, will be living on average 80 years. Uh, in the least developed countries, the poorest countries in the world, uh, that baby on average will live 65 years. But the other very important thing on this chart is that, as you can see back in 1950, the difference between poor and rich was 30 years in life expectancy. But today, that difference is down to only 17. So there's also been this convergence, right, in terms of the uh, life expectancy, which means that the poor countries in the world are catching up with the richer countries in terms of life expectancy. So if we have forecasts about the number of babies born, and we also have forecasts about how long those babies will live, then we can calculate the size of populations. So I'm going to show you a chart that does that. The only big thing that I need to remind you about the chart is that 
of course, babies can be born in one part of the world and then they can migrate to another part of the world. So I'm going to hold migration constant at today's levels and we'll see what happens. So the chart that I'm about to show you is a chart that I drew for the first time about seven years ago. And when I first saw it on my computer screen, I could not believe my eyes. I thought I had made a mistake. But in fact, I didn't make a mistake. It was correct. So this is the chart. This is using the latest data as of now. And here what you see is, again, the same time scale. We start in 1950. We go to the year 2020 with actual data. And then the rest are forecasts into the future. Very clear what we're measuring here is what percentage of the world's population is in different regions or countries in the world. And look at Africa, right? 55 countries, including Egypt, big increase, right? Relative to other parts of the world. The reason, of course, is that there's more babies being born in Africa and their life expectancy is growing faster than in other parts of the world. Remember what I just told you. Another somewhat that big increase is in South Central Asia over here. This includes India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. And then two very big declines, China. And if you add to China, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, you get East Asia. And then also Europe, right? So meanwhile, the Middle East called Western Asia here, the United States and uh, Latin America, relatively stable, okay? So the big changes are Africa. Africa is gonna become, as you see here by the year 2030, the second biggest region in the world by population. And look, back in 1950, Africa was very small, only 9% of the total in the world, but now it's gonna be 20%. And then also by the year 2030, Europe, remember Europe used to be the second biggest region in the world after East Asia, Europe will become the fifth largest in the world. So it's a completely different situation, right? By the year 2030, completely different situation in terms of the balance of uh, power, uh, in terms of population in different parts of the world. But let's examine then what are some of the more specific implications. So let's examine first young people. So people between the ages of 15 and 35. Today we call them millennials, okay? Uh, here what you have is how many millions are there here uh, in the year 2020. So in India, for example, 478 million people between these ages. And then uh, what is the forecast for the year 2030, okay? Similarly, you have Egypt over here, okay? With 33 million young people today between those two ages. So these are the largest countries in the world by population. So there are three types of countries here. India is gonna have more young people. Egypt is also gonna have more young people. But then you have other countries like China that are gonna have fewer young people because they're not having as many babies today. So uh, China is gonna go from 396 to 337. And then you have countries like the United States, which is gonna go from 90 to 89.5, the same amount, okay? Now, keep in mind though, here in the United States of these 89.5 million people in the year 2030, many of them are going to be minorities, what we call minorities here, African-Americans, Asian-Americans, and Hispanics. So much so that the US government projects that by the year 2030, slightly more than half of these people are gonna be what today we call minority groups. So in other words, the minorities are going to be the majority of the US population in this younger age group. So as you can see, big changes, right? Some countries are gonna have more young people. That includes Egypt, as well as India, for example. Some countries are gonna have many fewer young people like China. And some countries like the US, about the same. However, that young age group is gonna be very, very diverse here in the United States. Now, let's go to the other end of the age distribution. And that's the population above the age of 60. And here, once again, we have the countries in the world with the largest number of people above the age of 60. And look, here, every country in the world is going to have more. China is going to have 110 million more people above the age of 60. India is going to have 40 million more people 
50 million more people above the age of 60. The United States is going to have 15 million more. Uh, Egypt uh, doesn't uh, come into the uh, table uh, uh, in terms of the size of this uh, age group, but it's right here underneath uh, Ukraine. And uh, it will also have Egypt, your country, more people above the age of 60. So every country in the world, right? <clears throat> now think about the pandemic, right? Well, the pandemic is going to have the following effect. Young couples, when they see that the economic uncertainty is big, perhaps they've lost their job or they fear losing their job, they're going to postpone having babies. They will eventually have the number of babies that they want to have, but they're going to wait a year. They're going to wait two years until the uncertainty dissipates. And the mere postponement of having babies reduces the fertility rate, as we saw earlier, and therefore it accelerates population aging, relatively speaking. Right. So once again, what we see is that this pandemic is accelerating the decline in the number of babies and it's accelerating population aging. Now, I want to bring to your attention something that I think is extremely important, which is given that we're going to have so many people above the age of 60, in Japan, they're going to have 40% of their population, 40% above the age of 60, right? Followed then by China, by Europe, by the United States, Latin America, and so on. So I call this the phenomenon of the gray consumer. For the first time in history, the population above age 60 will be the largest consumer segment in the market the largest consumer segment of the market. And in many countries, once again, beginning with Japan and China, it will represent between 35 and 40% of the population, okay? By the way, here in the United States, this group, the people above the age of 60, they own 80% of the net worth. So they have purchasing power, although it may be unequally uh, distributed within that group. And this is the most important thing that I would like you to take into consideration. I'm referring to people above the age of 60, but I don't want to call them old because I think old and young are distinctions that no longer are useful. Because today, as I say here, a 60 year old today stays in much better physical and mental shape than a 60 year old two generations ago. So somebody age 60, age 65, age 70 today is still perfectly able of working, uh, wants to have a great life, wants to travel, wants to do things, right? So in other words, somebody who is in his 60s or her 60s, 70s, 80s, stays in much better health today than 20, 30, 50 years ago. And that's something that we need to consider. So one important implication then that I'm projecting here, you see, we have these two things going on, longer life expectancy, and then technology is accelerating knowledge obsolescence. In other words, what we learn when we're young becomes antiquated, becomes old very quickly. And so the traditional life cycle model that we went first to, uh, you know, when we were children and we would play, then we would study, then we would work, and finally we would retire. I think uh, that was perfectly fine when people on average live 60 years. Okay, but now that we're living on average 80 years, um, the situation has changed dramatically, right? Not only that, remember that if uh, you only go to school when you're a teenager or when you're in your early 20s, if you go to college, most likely whatever you learned by the time you're 40 or 50 these days with all of that technological change will have become obsolete, will have become uh, relatively useless. So I think we're going to see a new model emerging in which uh, people will have not only multiple jobs, but multiple careers during their lifetime. So I think, uh, for example, universities, but also companies will need to think more in terms of lifelong learning. So people will perhaps go to school several times. They will go to school, to college when they're 20 or 18, and then they will work for 20 years. Then they will feel the need to go back to college again at age 40. They will work for another 20 years and then they will go back again at age 60 and maybe they will work for another 10 years before they retire or 15 years. Uh, so I think this is extremely important that people are not going to have just one career. They're going to have several careers and maybe they will choose a different career each time that they go back to school. 
Accordingly, of course, not only universities will need to change, but also companies and governments will need to adjust to this. Now, the other thing that I want to throw in the mix here about uh, the future of work is something very simple, uh, remote work. Uh, we're going through a big experiment uh, right now, it's already been 11 months of remote work. And as you can see on the screen, after so many months, I think we have realized where are the advantages, the pros, and where are the disadvantages, the cons of remote work. So I think we're gonna to go towards a hybrid model in which perhaps we work from home a couple of days a week, and then we commute to the office for the rest of the week. But more importantly, the big change that I think is coming is that there's gonna be more offshoring of jobs. Because now that we have 50% of the population, working population here in the United States working remotely, now both the workers and the companies know that it is possible perhaps even good for people to be working remotely. But if people work remotely, that means that you, know, you can work from anywhere in the world, not just from a city that is uh, where you live. And therefore companies will be able to hire any worker in the world and then have that worker perform his or her duties on a remote basis. So let's say for example, a company in Singapore needs another marketing person and they find the best possible person for the job let's say in Egypt, right? Normally that person would need to move from Egypt to Singapore to work for that company. But now what I think uh, is very clear is that uh, that person can stay in Cairo or in Alexandria and work remotely for that company in Singapore. So I think we're gonna see more offshoring of jobs, more offshoring of tasks as a result of this. Now, the second step in my methodology and in about seven minutes or so then Carmen, uh, we're going to start uh, taking questions then. It's follow the money, right? So let's multiply these numbers by how much of babies, by how much money they will have in their pockets. First of all, I want to point out that emerging markets are doing better in terms of uh, gross domestic product growth, growth of the economy during this pandemic than mature economies. Uh, you see here for, for mature economies, there was a the black bar, a decline of about uh, six and a half percent in GDP during the year 2020. And the projected growth, uh, you know, or recovery in 2021, which is the green bar, will be about uh, four, uh, perhaps uh, three and a half percent. But in emerging and developing economies, the decline was much less when you compare this bar here to this one here. And the recovery will be stronger and swifter. And some of those emerging markets, especially China, look at the figures for China they didn't have a contraction in GDP in 2020. They actually had a little bit of growth unlike the rest of the world. And then when you take a look at the green area, you, uh, bar, you will see that it's, they're gonna have a very, very strong and robust recovery. So in other words, that China and the rest of East Asia are searching ahead. They're growing even faster than before relative to the rest of the world. So here what we have is the purchasing power of the middle class, which of course is most of the consumer market in any country in the world. And what you can see is that today in the year uh, 2021, the European Union and the United States are still quite big, but they're gonna be relatively small as a percentage of the world's total. But India and China are gonna become really big because every year they have more people in their middle class and the wages, the income of that middle class is growing every year, right? So the purchasing power of the middle class is growing for both reasons. There's more people in the middle class every year who uh, are lifted out of poverty. And secondly, they are making more money year after year. Now, I also want to bring to your attention something really important, which is that um, uh, if you... Uh, go to uh, the year 2050 as opposed to stopping in the year 2030. You see that India becomes at some point a bigger market than China. Not, not a bigger economy, right? But a bigger consumer market for middle-class consumption. And the reason for that, of course, is that India has a younger population. And with a younger population, you have more people buying homes, more people buying automobiles, more people buying um, appliances for the home. And that essentially means more consumer spending. So now, what are some of the considerations here? As I told you earlier, for the longest time, companies would launch a brand 
and they will have the American consumer in mind. They would, they would design the product. They would make the product and they would sell the product with the American consumer in mind. And I think that's going to change. From now on, they're going to have to also pay attention to the Asian consumer because Asian consumer markets are becoming so big. Uh, but we're also going to see changes with regulation. So look, the largest markets in the world write the rules of the game, such as product standards or antitrust or competition policies. So it used to be uh, the case that only the United States would have global influence over product standards. And then 20 years ago, the European Union countries came together as one big market. And then they also are now important regulators. Uh, so my projection is that by the year 2030, in addition to Europe and the United States, we're also going to see China and possibly also India issuing product standards that the whole world will need to follow. And then lastly, of course, implications for geopolitics, the balance of power in the world. Uh, I think we're moving towards a multipolar world in which, in addition to the United States and to a certain extent Europe, we're also going to have obviously China and I think a little bit later on India becoming important influential powers in the world. Now, before I give you a, a quick sense of uh, technological changes, let me spend a couple of minutes on women. You see, as we speak today, in nearly 40% of American households uh, where there is a husband and a wife, the wife makes more money than the husband in 40%, right? Uh, 20 years ago, that was you know, no more than 5%. And the US government is projecting that by the year 2030, in more than 50% of those households, the wife will make more money than the husband. And that is, uh, or will be a really important moment in history because it's never been true, right? Uh, in an advanced uh, economy uh, that uh, women uh, would make more money than men. And once again, that is driven by education. Now, more broadly, what we're seeing is uh, an accumulation, as you know, of wealth at the top of the distribution in the world. Here you have how many millions of millionaires, people with at least $1 million we have in the world. And as you can see, uh, back in 2008, it was 8 million, but that number has more than doubled uh, over the last uh, uh, 12 years uh, to 18 million people, okay? Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, there's more and more women in that group. Uh, so as of last year, 2020, for the first time in history, we've had 50% of those millionaires, of those high net worth individuals, people with at least a million dollars uh, of wealth uh, being women. And my projection is that by the year 2030, women in general will come to own more than half of the world's net worth for the first time. So why is that important? that women now have more money. And again, women have more money because now they have better educational opportunities. They stay in school, they graduate from high school. Many of them go to college, they get a graduate degree. Uh, but also, uh, you know, this will essentially mean that if they have more money in their pockets, several things will change. One is consumption. Consumer markets are gonna change because women, we know this happens in every country in the world, prefer to spend more money on education, healthcare, and insurance. And by the way, not just for themselves, but also for their parents, their children, and their grandchildren. Well, uh, education, healthcare, and insurance, by the way, are 30% of the economy, those sectors. They're really, really big. Uh, so a lot of things are gonna change. Also, when it comes to savings, uh, depending on the stage in life, women tend to save more money than men on average. And if that's the case, then we're gonna see a fundamental reallocation of um, uh, you know, income uh, in terms of the uh, priorities, whether it's for consumption or for savings. Uh, so what you can see is that on average, women tend to place more value in the future, right? So they prefer to invest in education. They prefer to invest in healthcare. They prefer to have better insurance. They save more money. So all of those things are associated with uh, caring more about the future, being in a position to be able to uh, be successful in the future. And when it comes to investments, which is the last point that you see over here, we also find a similar thing, which is that women prefer asset classes in which to invest their savings that are less risk than men, right, on average. And, and that, I think, explains why there is uh, this popularity recently of index funds, because as you know, stock market index funds uh, are less volatile. 
So they uh, have less risk than uh, buying the shares of, um, of a, an individual uh, company. So this is what I call the wild effect. Uh, after Oscar Wilde, the Irish playwright, in one of his plays, he, uh, one of his characters says, uh, quote, women try their luck, comma, men risk theirs, unquote, right? So women tend to be more risk averse. They tend to care more about the future to the extent that now women have more money and they have more wealth. Then we're going to see big changes in the economy, specifically in consumer markets, in financial markets. So lastly, just one minute, uh, Kerman, and then we'll go to questions. How about technology? Well, more robots than workers in the service sector, especially not so much in manufacturing. I, I think we're going to see more automation in retail, education, financial services, home care, health care. Consequences. Well, there's going to be fewer jobs, right? We're going to have more technological unemployment. And therefore, I think that we're going to have to do something very simple. We're going to have to start taxing the robots the same way that we tax the workers so that then we can use that tax revenue to pay for retraining programs for the human workers who are displaced. And then lastly, as you know, there are big debates right now, both in Europe and the United States about a universal basic income. If we're gonna have a lot of people displaced by automation, by robotics, by artificial intelligence and so on, we may need to actually give every family a basic income so that they can cover their necessities. Now, more computers than brains. Well, this is all about smart infrastructure in transportation, energy, water, the homes. We're gonna have more sensors, more microprocessors, running all of those uh, pieces of infrastructure for us. That's what's called the internet of things. And then let's not forget about the blockchain, right? So um, in the government, inside of companies, among companies, we're gonna see a lot of implementation of this new technology. And then lastly, more currencies than countries, right? So I don't think it's gonna be Bitcoin that is gonna become widely used around the world because Cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin are a threat to governments and to central banks. They don't like them because they threaten their monetary policy. And of course, they want to keep control over the money supply. But I believe that there's a future for cryptocurrencies as long as they become part of something that I call digital tokens. So this is a bundle of electronic services. Uh, the examples that uh, come to mind are those in Estonia, in Europe, Ghana or Kenya in Africa that have already uh, implemented these digital tokens. So digital tokens are not just money. They're also discount coupons, incentives, smart contracts, even voting rights so that people can vote in elections or shareholders can vote uh, at the annual shareholder meeting of their company. And of course, also currency, cryptocurrency. So I believe that we will see a future with cryptocurrencies as long as they are part of a digital token that is a broader bundle of services. So let me stop there and see which questions we have, okay? Once again, I have emphasized to you population trends, also trends in emerging markets and the rise of the middle class in Asia, and then lastly, technology. Uh, so let's now see uh, what comments or questions uh, have been coming in. Thank you so much, Maru. That's fascinating. Um, before we go, before we turn the floor to the audience, I just want to uh, highlight things. I was lucky to read your book, 2030, and I have to say it's this, what you call the latter danger on the way you, we, in um, analyzing a specific trend vertically that we fail to see the collective dynamics of these many forces coming together and uh, the outcome of, uh, of their uh, uh, interaction. And the book has a wealth of examples on how these dynamics work. So this is, uh, I really uh, uh, recommend uh, you go and, and check this, uh, this book. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we have a question from uh, Yusuf. Anwar, Yusuf, do you want to ask the question yourself? You can unmute yourself and go ahead. <laughs> um, I was just asking about um, why would we ro tax robots? Because 
as, as a worker, I tax, uh, the, the government collect tax from me to give me some services in return. So why would we do that to robots? Yeah, that's a great question. So you pay taxes, I know, and I also pay taxes. And uh, with those taxes, we pay for many different things. We pay for uh, roads, we pay for transportation, we pay for healthcare, we pay for the military, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but now, as you know, um, robots are replacing human beings. Artificial intelligence is also going to destroy a lot of jobs. So we need to have resources to retrain those people who are displaced. So we should collect money from the robots, meaning from the companies that use the robots, and then use those monies to pay for re-education, retraining of those workers who have been displaced. Because otherwise, those people are going to be technologically unemployed. Uh, so they're going to be part of this technological unemployment. And it's going to be very difficult to have an economy that way, because if people don't have a job, they don't have income, then they cannot be consumers. And we are in a consumer economy. So that's the logic behind taxing the robots. And there are several proposals out there uh, regarding that, uh, that possibility. Okay, thank you, Moro. Uh, let me uh, also ask you about something uh, related. It's so much concerning the public discourse now related to the artificial intelligence and people's privacy. The issue has always been there, but the point is that it's brought to the surface now. Do you think this would affect uh, uh, the future of business in terms of, um, since we say that the consumers in certain part of the world will lead the markets and usually these governments, they have their political issues uh, and certain perception about privacy and what so so do you, how do you think this would affect the future of business? Well, I think uh, companies are going to be affected by all of these trends. And uh, as we were commenting earlier, it's very important to think about the trends laterally and see how they come together. So I see a lot of opportunities for companies right now, uh, but also, of course, a need of, uh, 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 for adaptation, for adjustments, for changing the way in which they operate. Uh, so the opportunities are clear, right? I mean, if there's a big middle class uh, growing in Asia, that's a potentially big market. But then the company, of course, has to go over there and sell. Um, also, uh, new technology, technology that uh, helps us uh, become more efficient. And also technology that perhaps, as I mentioned earlier, helps companies attract talent, higher talent, whatever that talent may be in the world, without uh, having to consider whether that person has to move or not. So I think the opportunities for companies are huge. But what I think is really important is that companies think that uh, you know, we're now in the middle of a pandemic and everybody's trying to survive the pandemic. We're all in survival mode. But you see, the issue is that we're not going to go back to where we were before the pandemic because the world has already changed, right, as a result of this pandemic. So we're going to be in a very different situation uh, after this uh, pandemic. And therefore, everybody has to adjust, including companies. So it's not as easy as saying, oh, let me just uh, make sure that I can go back to where I was in the year 2019. That's not going to work. For example, now you have um, a much uh, greater percentage of uh, consumers using online uh, channels. And you also have uh, workers uh, uh, working remotely. You have that the emerging markets in Asia are becoming much, much bigger than before the pandemic. So all of those changes require adaptation. So I think businesses, what they need to do is to look forward, try to understand what the future will bring, and then take action today so that they're ready for that challenge. Thank you. We have a very interesting question from Connie uh, asking about how different are the aging consumers um, than the American and what, what are the expectation in this regard? What are your expectations in this regard? Well, look, um, increasingly what we're seeing is that uh, people about the age of 60, they want to continue um, you know, wearing nice clothes. They want to go out to restaurants. Uh, they want to travel the world. Uh, but many of them also, they want to continue working, right? Because otherwise they think uh, they may get bored. I mean, you know, to be in retirement, maybe 10 years, that's okay. But if a 60 year old is expected to live to age 84, right? That's another 24 years, that's a lifetime. Um, so I think uh, what we need to do is to abandon this classic image that we have in our minds that we have some people who are young and some people who are old. I think we need to abandon that because the people who are, we say old, right, around quotation marks, 
they're really not different than the others. They're just, uh, you know, um, have more years behind them, uh, but they want to continue working. They want to continue being consumers. They're very connected now, especially after the pandemic, because uh, some of them were reluctant to use computers or the internet before the pandemic, but now they've been forced to use it. Um, so all of this is essentially creating a segment of the market there that is completely different from you know, the way that segment uh, looked like uh, 20 or 30 years ago. But not only that, it's also much, much bigger, right? Much, much bigger because once again, the number of babies is coming down. And so the people who are now 60 or 70 years old were born at a time when a lot of babies were born, right? So in other words, not only this market is now more sophisticated, but also it's numerically much bigger. Thank you. Uh, we have a very interesting question from Diana. Diana, would you like to weigh in and ask the question or? Okay. Okay, she's asking, there is a high amount of students from China and India who study in Europe and USA, but it's not so much the other way around. Uh, we can assume China and India, and India understand the Western culture better than the other way around. Uh, what should the average European American uh, 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 do in order to better understand the Chinese Indian population? Yeah, so look, the first thing that I think we need to do is we need the governments uh, in Europe and the United States to sit down with China and to have a conversation about the future. Because China cannot be ignored. But by the same token, China cannot ignore Europe or the United States either, right? Or Africa for that matter. And as you know, of course, uh, China is investing uh, big time in Africa. So we're all in the same world. It's an interconnected world. It's a globalized uh, setting. So we need to understand each other. And that's why I think it has to start at the leadership level. But then, as you said, it's very important to um, encourage people to learn about each other's cultures and to learn the language and to, and yes, uh, there's um, much, much greater numbers of Chinese students in Europe, in the United States, also in Latin America, I've noticed, and I'm sure there's also quite a few in some um, African universities. But the point is the following, is that, uh, yes, we should definitely also send students to China. So we need programs uh, to uh, take uh, more students of our students to China in the hope that then that will not only help us understand China and therefore be more effective in this global economy in which China plays a very important role, but also we will be able to uh, come together, right? Because the more people who study in each other's countries, I think uh, the better are the chances for mutual understanding. Yes, thank you. Jacob uh, ha has a question. Um, hi. Uh, Hello. Actually, I have a question on, on the China front. Um, although, uh, b before I get into that, it's, uh, the, what your, your point about people working into old age is, is one that I experienced actually at, at Penn uh, in my undergrad. I had a number of professors who taught well into their 80s, um, and they always joked about this and how it was so hard to get a job in academia now because people talk for so long. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, my, my question actually has to do more with China. Um, I, I worked in international trade before I came to AUC. And what that meant is that I spent a whole lot of time talking about and looking into issues of US-China trade. And this sort of, I think what some people would, would describe as uh, you know, a possible bifurcation of, uh, in a lot of different respects, in, in the markets and in, in goods and services markets. Um, in education, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I think that when this started out, people were thinking that, oh, you know, this this might be sort of a, a Trumpian thing, which is likely to pass uh, with a change of administration. But I think what quickly became evident to a lot of people is that it started. This started to become somewhat of a Washington consensus, and there's mm -hmm. been a whole lot of issues with, you know, both on the security front and on the human rights front. Uh, yeah. You know, for example, there's a, there's a dearth of trust, which is which has uh, between two, the two countries, which has resulted, I think, in a lot of significant business impact. Uh, but also there's, there's the human rights issue. I think with, like the NBA, if you, if you recall, when, when, the, when uh, so some NBA team manager made a comment about Hong Kong and you know, the Chinese government got very upset about it, a lot of people in America were paying attention to that. And 
there, there was this whole question of, of should U.S. companies sort of conform to uh, what the wishes of the Chinese government in certain respects. And so anyway, I guess my question is, where do you see this whole kind of new Cold War thing going? Do you think that this is here to stay? Uh, do you think that, that we're going to see American companies sort of uh, adopt to the Chinese market to serve, as you said, to serve the Chinese consumer, or will they not do that for political and and sort of uh, you know image reasons and be supplanted by non-U.S. companies? Where, where do you see this this whole yeah, thing going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, look, um, first of all, I don't think we are in a Cold War situation, at least not the kind of Cold War before, because uh, the American economy and the Soviet economy were not integrated with one another, right? Uh, as you know, the economic relationship and financial relationship uh, between China and the United States is the single most important bilateral relationship in the world, right? Trade, uh, government bonds, everything is in there. Technology, of course. Now, like, um, you know, whenever you have such a, a big uh, relationship, economic relationship with another country, there's always going to be frictions. There's always going to be problems. There's always going to be, uh, you know, differences of opinion. And I think the issue is that we have ignored them for the last 20 or 30 years. And then came President Trump and he said, OK, I'm going to be making decisions now. Right. And I think the solution to this is once again to have the United States and China sit at the table and talk about their issues, because the global economy cannot work unless the U.S. and China uh, are in a good relationship. Uh, because once again, the two economies are very much interrelated at this point. Now, the other thing that I want to mention is about manufacturing here in the United States. Um, so it is true that employment in manufacturing in the U.S. has declined over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Uh, right now, we have 40 percent fewer workers employed in manufacturing in the United States, 40 percent. But over the same time period, manufacturing output in the United States is 200 percent higher, three times as big. So three times as much manufacturing output, but with 40% fewer workers. So what has happened to American manufacturing is not that it has declined, it's that productivity has increased by so much, right? Uh, that now we can produce so much more with fewer workers. Now, having said that, of course, entire industries um, have declined, that is true, like uh, textiles, like uh, steel and so on. But other manufacturing industries like aircraft or precision instruments, or now electric vehicles, um, have become much bigger. So I think from the point of view of American policy, what we need to do is two things. One is come to an agreement with China as to how the two economies are going to relate to one another in the future. And number two is continue to make the transition away from industries where there's too much competition in the world, like steel or textiles, uh, 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 certain kinds of appliances and so on, and invest in the new industries, clean energy, electric vehicles, uh, supercomputers, um, solar powered aircraft, all of those things, right? That's the way to go. Because if the US tries to compete with steel or tries to compete with um, uh, textiles, it's gonna lose that battle. Right? Because after China, it's not just China. You also have Vietnam, you have Bangladesh, you have Indonesia, you have, uh, and later on, of course, Africa, right? Sub-Saharan Africa uh, with plenty of labor. So uh, the US cannot compete on the basis of cheap labor. We have to compete on the basis of technology, knowledge, productivity, and so on. So that's the way I see it, right? But uh, the number one requirement is the US and China need to sit at the table. I mean, unlike the Cold War with the Soviet Union, the global economy now cannot work without the US and China coming to some kind of an understanding. Do we have- Thank you so uh, much, Dr. Aung. Yeah. Uh, we have, we'll take two questions. Okay, two quick questions. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I have, it, it, it's, a, it's a comment and I'm seeking your, your opinion. When I look at the, uh, the, the growth of the Asian middle class and economy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you're looking at it from a pure consumerism point of view. But I look at it also from a point of view, when you look globally where the engineers are, 
the engineers are in this area also. Yeah, yeah. And they have technology. When you look, for example, at research in STEM technology, it's basically Taiwan, Singapore, China. In yeah. addition to your typical classical. Uh, so those, those, I mean, at some point, they're going to get very similar to the relation between the UK and the US at yeah. the start of the, in, at some point, they're going to decide, hey, let's have our own companies, our own brands. And instead of buying made in Europe or made yeah. in, in the USA, we make it in, in Asia. Absolutely. If this happens, then you're really talking about a huge shift in power to Asia. Now, that's one thing. Now, the other thing, when you, when you look at the migration, the migration has a very interesting effect, in, 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 especially in Europe. I mean, migration uh, combined with inequality, we're seeing for the first time a social disruption that we haven't seen since the end of World War. I mean, in France, the yellow jackets, uh, the, the yellow vests just before the, uh, the, uh, the, the pandemic, this is an equality thing. I mean, you're talking again yep. about migration that has yep. caused extremism. Yep. And that's kind of, I'm, I'm talking even in Africa. I mean, you tend to think about Africa, but when you talk about a huge uh, middle class that's educated, I mean, at some point, you're going to find that Africa is going to become uh, very democratized. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I completely agree with you, Ali. Uh, the implications are also for politics, uh, because uh, remember, especially in democracies, the backbone of a democracy is the middle class. You cannot have a democracy unless you have a large middle class. It's very difficult, right? I mean, one could say India is the exception, right? Because India has been a democracy since independence, and it really didn't have a big middle class uh, until recently. Uh, that's true. But I think it's more the exception rather than the rule. Uh, and then the second point, uh, which you mentioned is really important, is inequality. So we have forgotten that inequality can be a cancer, right? And, 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 and it spreads very quickly with uh, devastating effects. And as you mentioned, immigration tends to be good. That's my argument. Of course, I'm an immigrant myself. But not only that, I mean, immigration at a time when you have inequality and you have uh, high unemployment, is very difficult to deal with politically. And that's why we have a backlash in Europe and the United States. Brexit, I think, is about sovereignty, but it's also about immigration. Um, so I think all of these problems, uh, once again, thinking laterally about the situation, they all come together. You, you cannot separate the problem with immigration with the problem with inequality, with automation, how that is destroying jobs for uh, local people, and also with uh, problems having to do with uh, the rise of these emerging markets in Asia. So all of these things come together, right? And they produce an explosive situation. That's why I think uh, leaders in the world have to sit at the table and they have to start thinking about how all of these issues are connected or interconnected, because otherwise there's gonna be no solution. And we're just gonna go from one crisis to the next. Thank you. We will take uh, one final question, and I want to apologize for, for, for the audience. We have more than 17 questions sent to us. Uh, I'm really sorry that we cannot take them on. So, uh, Dr. Shirwat? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Okay, let's take a Thank question you. from... Uh, okay, sure. Hi. Hi, Mara. How are you? Hi. Good. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Um, so uh, you mentioned a lot, you know, when you even speak about uh, the U.S. and China, the whole company role, the private sector, the businesses. And then when it comes to China, you assume there is one state united. So do you see the uh, change? And the data you shared today is very national. Do you see a change in the nature of relationship between state and uh, businesses in developing countries? Africa especially, happening in the future. We don't have to go the China journey. You know, we can just leapfrog into what's going on somewhere else. Um, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, we're also seeing these, you know, different kinds of uh, capitalism, if you want to uh, put it that way. We have mm -hmm. Chinese capitalism, which is very state orchestrated, uh, mm -hmm. although at the same time, they do have a lot of entrepreneurs and entre entrepreneurial companies. And then we have, uh, at the other end, the more liberal, uh, classic uh, capitalism here in the United States, maybe maybe in the UK, although 
uh, as you know, the government also plays an important role there in the economy, even after Thatcher and all of the privatizations. So I, I would say that, yes, that's another thing that is going on in the world right now. And um, obviously, given that the Chinese model seems to be working, there is the temptation to try to replicate it in other parts of the world by other kinds of countries. And of course, uh, I would be very wary of that because uh, China, as you know, um, you know, has a model that has been successful for its own purposes. But I don't think it's easy to export the Chinese model at all. Uh, because first of all, you need to have a, a government bureaucracy that works really well. Uh, and of course, China has 4,000 years worth of history in terms of bureaucratic administration. Uh, but uh, many countries, uh, I'm thinking now about Africa, I'm thinking about the Middle East, even in Latin America, uh, you see that they don't have that kind of uh, uh, capacity uh, on the part of uh, state officials to actually formulate and implement policy. So I'm a little bit skeptical about uh, the Chinese model succeeding in other parts of the world, but I know that uh, it's, being, it's being attempted. Thank you so much, Maru, and thank you for everyone for your questions and participation. Um, let me extend uh, the invitation for uh, next webinar. It's on Wednesday, uh, February 3rd. It's going to be this. Our speaker will be uh, Professor Ted London, and we're going to talk about business models for the BOP. Uh, bottom of the pyramid. So thank you so much, Maru. Thank you, everyone, thank you. and uh, have a great day. Thank you for having me. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.